Stuck, if you want to say hello. Hi, I'm Anime Stuck. I am the host for Anime of the Year, one of the hosts for Anime of the Year. Yeah, we've got an exciting uh, lineup this year, and these are the uh, jurors for Anime of the Year that have come on to talk with y'all. Uh, it's just a handful of those jurors. Uh, we have going left to right, uh, Tehan Coming Storm. We usually just call him Storm. <laughs> And then we have the Lou. We've got Midas. Hello. And we've got Addy MG. Now, uh, I guess we should kick this off with kind of the difficult question, which is, how do you decide what to watch? You know, there's a lot of shows. There's hundreds of anime shows every year. So how do you choose what to watch? Obviously, you don't watch everything. So can you just explain that process a little to us? Midas, you watch everything every year, right? So maybe you should kick us off and talk about uh, how awards is different to you from normal. Well, I pretty much watch, check out everything every single season. So I usually do is just go through every season, or every season. So... I had a lot of shows I liked this year and just picked out the ones I've found shortlist worthy and shortlisted them and also went through uh, the shows I've gotten recommended from other people and shared my thoughts on those shows uh, for the other Animal of the Air jurors if we get any because we have a recommendation box and then I just we're getting re uh, recommendations from other jurors uh, and here we try to, the people that have seen them, try to discuss the cons and positives with them and whether I want to shortlist them and push for them as a potential nominee or just to, or if we don't think it's quite worthy for end of the year. Most of the recommendations we've gotten are really good, but it's end of the year, so we got to be the very best to make it. Okay, Storm, I see you're unmuted. Do you want to go ahead and answer next? So... I really only started watching anime last year, but it's been an absolutely wild ride for me as I've just sort of picked up on this seasonal hype train. And so for me, I'm quite similar to Midas, where I basically watch probably a good 80% of shows airing every season. From there, figuring out which ones have got the best elements in basically every area as to where I would choose to shortlist or not. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, I basically do not watch anime until and unless the awards come around. And, and then I like watch whatever people recommend, usually not just like from what we get in the suggestion box, but like just searching on the net or like what are the like in, in Sakuga circles, what's the proper shows that like people give attention to and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I basically do research and then start watching. Like this year I had only seen Cyberpunk and the Tatami Galaxy uh, sequel. And that's it before like coming into the jury. Now I've seen like a bunch of stuff, but yeah, I, I use the awards as a way to watch stuff. Okay. And Val, do you want to uh, give us an answer too? Yeah. So, uh, kind of similar, uh, to a lot of people here. Uh, most of the year, I'll be watching shows uh, seasonally. And uh, when I'm deciding on shows, you know, there's all sorts of factors. You could look at, you know, news uh, announcements. So like, a let's say a series that I read a manga of a while ago is getting announced um, and is airing this year. I Maybe you'll check it out. In previous years, I was more, you know, whatever is airing, just watch everything. But nowadays, it's more, what are the staff like on this? What are the first couple episodes like? You can kind of follow the the three episode rules sort of thing that people do. I don't follow that super closely, but it's more just like a general feel. Like, okay, is this looking good after a couple episodes? Yeah, is it going to fall, you know, apart towards the end or something? But for the most part, you know, if it's a good staff team that I know and like, then I'll probably follow through with that. Um, and as you guys said, with fall season, it's pretty much like every other show is amazing. The topic of DIY is one which is very familiar to me. And so similarly to everyone who's spoken so far, the production quality of DIY is pretty astounding. Definitely a different take on your average cute girls doing cute things show. The cast is quite lively to watch, but it still has some downsides. But we'll save those for another time. Uh, one question that we got was about the hidden gems this year. Can you talk maybe about some of those uh, hidden gems? I know that people have talked about Yamano Susume some 
uh, that's got its fourth season right now. Uh, yeah, so I I am personally like a big Yamun Susume fan. Like, if I don't know if anybody here has been in the watch longs in the rewatches for Yamun Susume and the sub, but uh, <coughs> I pretty much did the production notes for the entire show for the first three seasons in the when we did the rewatches like this last year, I think something like that. But yeah, and so I am a huge fan of the show, and this season has been like, it's been bigger and better essentially because they've gone from like three minutes episodes to thirteen minutes episodes, so now it's like twenty four minutes episodes, and they have like really uh, needled themes which I didn't think they would be able to. That they've inc- uh, and it's quite unlike other Saul shows in which it's like it builds a whole community with like the parents are an integral part of the cast and like like the, in the latest episode we get, get introduced to Hinata's mother and it's entirely about her and she's like this really exuberant character who's like stressed from work and so she essentially does bonding time with her daughter to like de-stress and that becomes uh, something about how the characters themselves see how they're going to age up, what they're going to do. And it, it creates a really nice contrast. And uh, I think this show is the, it becomes really unique in this way. But also we have, we have this whole storyline that's been following for, we've been following for like three seasons now where uh, Aoi is trying to like essentially climb Mount Fuji for the first time. It, it's been one of our dreams and that's why the whole show is going. And I'm, uh, we still haven't reached that part, but maybe like this season is hinting towards going to that. And so it's been really hyped in that department as well. It's it's quite niche for Reddit. Uh, I think only like, it gets like 200 or something, but the comment threads are really lively and there's a lot of discussion with like cool people with like Mirna and whatever. Uh, so, uh, and there's like a lot of, in those threads are really fun because we do a lot of analysis of the uh, the cinema the cinematography of the show and the uh, the writing which is like really strong yeah yeah it's a similar experience with me i think it's a pretty uh it's definitely not one you see many people talking about outside of usually like uh sakuga communities or um you know cute girls doing cute things kind of uh communities but I think it shines um, a lot with how every episode kind of has its own charm to it. You know, you've got these different staff highlights throughout. Um, sometimes the the character designs look a little different, and they each have their own, uh, you know, new personality brought to characters. Um, and also the whole, the, like, the whole experience of the show is different because the first season's, like, a short series, a very short series is, like, five minute episodes i think and then the second one uh went to being a normal short so i think it was like 15 minute episodes something like that um and now we finally have one it's not a full season because of recaps but um you basically have all these really awesome looking full-length episodes uh with a cast you already know and love and they just keep getting better so it's definitely one worth checking out if you appreciate some of the more i guess passionate projects in a sense Yeah, so unfortunately, I haven't gone around to checking out Yamano Susume and these guys' recommendations yet. But if we uh, do a daylight savings and spring back to spring, uh, there was this uh, little watched uh, slice of life show as well, I feel, um, called Daimon. And now Daimon is probably one of the most chill shows which I've watched this year. And being a working uh, working man, coming home and just being able to de-stress by watching anime is absolutely fantastic. And for all of the spring season, Diamond just um, fit that um, slot for me. Now, the setting of the show deals with traditional sweets primarily. And so... In doing so, it follows a family dynamic, uh, a, a, a new family dynamic, um, or rather adopted family, I should say, uh, where there's this uh, character, Itsuka, who, well, she was basically abandoned by her parents, and this sweet shop was kind enough to take her in. And the show explores um, themes of brokenness and uh, various pieces with regards to um, 
gender identity and personal struggles and self-motivation and self-worth and the entire approach of the show in addressing these matters is just so incredibly wholesome that it was perfect to relax to and on top of all of that it's got stunning background art and the show is just beautiful to watch um, in addition to all of the excellent character arcs and drama I'll go back to another family show that's probably the most overlooked, at least least watched of the one brought up, a small show called Shimimo. It focuses on this uh, group of sisters, a household, uh, where small spirits, think kind of Hello Kitty like mascot characters, uh, come from hell uh, and a devil dude come and live with them. It's a weird mix of dark comedy and slapstick uh, as this devil that visits them uh, tries to uh, understand uh, what's going on in the human realm because he's trying to spread hell uh, around them. Uh, But together with uh, uh, the sisters, he noticed that living on Earth itself is kind of just as bad as the hell he's trying to bring uh, but and it's uh, very interesting how it tries to uh, validate uh, the small everyday issues we face in life uh, facing them in a comedic and accepting light uh, where we get to various them with the characters so it's primarily a comedy so those moments are more on the side, uh, where it does a brilliant job setting up each episode in two halves. Uh, first half, uh, usually focusing up two halves, uh, where it focuses on building up a strong punchline with the use of repetition and anticipation throughout the entire episode. And the different sisters are, one of them is very small. Uh, I'm not sure if she was elementary or middle schooler, other one is a college student, while the last one is an office worker. Uh, so that way we get to uh, get a look into all different uh, types of life situation. Uh, so we can always find it relatable, whether we're watching it as a young viewer or an older viewer. I also really like the cartoon expressiveness of the show, where all of the characters got really squashy and stretching and morphing all of the time, especially the small round mascot characters. So I'd say it's one of the most visually uh, unique uh, shows of the season, uh, where I really like the comfortable color palette as well. But the art will most likely put some people off, so it's kind of a hit or miss uh, with the art. But I really like the art style because it's really building its own identity. Excellent. Glad uh, we got to hit on some of those um, more underground shows. Um, As far as uh, stuff that aired earlier in the year that might have had a larger audience um did anything really stand out to y'all um like uh i know that some of y'all have talked about uh osama ranking or uh, also some talk on uh Lycoris and uh i believe akebi as well None of y'all had any any thoughts on any of those shows? I'll pop in first, I guess. (laughs) Um, Well, at the start of the year... Pardon? Oh, Thal, yeah, that's me. I want to know that it was Thal, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, of those three shows, I quite enjoyed all of them, but one of the three stands out most to me, um, that being Osama Ranking. So, I remember the first... uh, kind of key visual dropped for that uh, and it being announced as a WIT production um, and coming off of all their work on uh, Attack on Titan all the years um, and their recent shows with like Great Pretender, I thought, okay, let's let's see what, what they've got to show. And uh, 
right away after the first episode, you knew you were in for something special. Um, it takes this, you know, fairy tale kind of aesthetic, um, pumps it full of just wonderful animation and character, and uh, just like tells this wonderful fantasy story about this um, deaf prince who wants to be strong like his father, but uh, is, you know, pushed around, is expected to not live up to what he wants to be because of his uh, disability, um, especially compared to his stronger brother. Um, and he meets up with another friend, and uh, an unlikely friend at that, and uh, they go on an adventure. And uh, I remember it being a pretty, definitely one of the more popular ones, I think, from that season. Um, in, in the, the winter season, that is. Um, and I think, at least for me, um, the overall experience um, all the way to the end was fantastic. Um, lots of high points, lots of, uh, you know, tense lower sections. But overall, uh, a wonderful experience that I'll definitely remember for years to come. So for for bigger shows that uh, of the year, at least from people that have seen it, according to you know different anime websites, um, definitely one to check out if you haven't uh, gotten the time to go around to it yet. Sorry, Storm, I saw that you were um, quite eager to speak there as well. So uh, what do you have to say about the less hidden gems of uh, this past year? Uh, well, similarly to uh, to Cell, uh, the well, Osama Ranking, I must say, was just probably my favorite adventure show of the year. Um, I do have a few issues with the direction of the storyline, but nonetheless, it, it, I believe it stands head and shoulders above everything else. Uh, the cast direction and the character motions and the way that uh, Bocci is a character and his um, difficulties and disabilities are addressed are all, um, it's excellent storytelling to follow his journey in this uh, show and the journey of um, his companion Kage as well. So um, when you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the disability uh, side of this and I was wondering um, if anyone has any feelings overall about uh, how the disability is presented. I, I know that just the both of you have said that it's been quite a good presentation, but I was wondering if anybody else disagrees or has any feelings about it, because it seems like that is like the obvious thing to talk about with uh, Ranking of Kings. You know, it's this deaf protagonist, and that's quite unusual in an anime, um, although it has been done before. Um, so I was just, anyway, Midas, go ahead. Yeah, I actually really, really liked how it was portrayed at the start of the show. Uh, they did a great job with all the sign language and uh, issues they had uh, conversing with other people. Um, but as the show goes on, let's say there is a sort of a translator that uh, gets in the, the, into the picture. So all the subtleties and issues uh, he usually had to convey uh, these feelings as a deaf and a mute person kind of gets sidelined as another person just... Uh, Walks over everything for him. I really like the show. It's a great show, but I feel like the mute and deaf issue was handled so much better in the early parts of the show before the translator uh, gets introduced and starts translating uh, his feelings and uh, what it, what tries to portray to other characters for us through almost exposition or narration. Uh, I understand that is the easier way, but it's not as interesting as what they had early on in the show. I'm not in a completely uh, similar camp there, but I do kind of agree. Um, there's, a, there's definitely a shift partway through, um, and it starts taking less time on, um, like earlier on, you know, you've got situations where people or he's trying to understand people um, and they can't really get good responses from him because, you know, he's got these disabilities. Um, but the focus on sort of um, sign language that they do and animate really nicely um, is, is something I respect quite a bit. Um, and it's definitely something that towards the end of the season as well um, comes back into play. Um, I think it being something that sort of steps away from the story it's not too big of a deal because we get a lot of it at the front and then it's sort of like 
we can spend more and more time on this or we can focus on the actual narrative, you know, but um, I think it's a reasonable complaint regardless. It's not a big issue for me either. It's more like a small thing if we're talking about the sign language and stuff. I thought they could have handled a bit better in the middle section. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things where it's kind of a tough thing to focus on because it's definitely an element of the story, but it's not also the main one. You know, you've got this um, kid that wants to succeed in life and be something more than uh, he seemingly is capable of. But then you also have to kind of treat this with respect and not, you know, go off the deep end with some crazy loophole to get out of it. But I think uh, with the whole friendship that goes on, um, it, it makes some sense. You've got friends that support you and, uh, you know, pick up the parts you're weaker at. So yeah, I absolutely adore that aspect of Borgia as well. Having the character uh, work as a catalyst to inspire those around him with his kindness and how he also relies on Kaga as his best friend and they support each other. That's a really good uh, mechanic. Awesome. Um, I noticed uh, a few of y'all also uh, had wanted to talk a bit about cyberpunk, I believe. Um, is there anything in particular that y'all uh, wanted to talk about with regards to that? I, I th haven't heard from uh, Addy in a little while, so. Uh, uh, sure, sure, I'll talk about cyberpunk. Uh, cyberpunk is, uh, I feel like it's quite a straightforward, like a crime thriller. Uh, just like presented with cyberpunk flavorings, but it's the presentation, like the confidence of its presentation is so nice. And you have like this, uh, like really trigger stylizations. It's like a beautiful, uh, the coloring is like, it's, uh, it's like very nice. It, it's like similar to BNA and Promare, but it's like still, it still works. Like trigger is doing trigger things. And uh, you have the, uh, the Ikarashi episode where it just goes all out in depicting the cyber psychosis element of the show, which is like just a minor part in the game, apparently. But they make this, like the whole plot about uh, struggling with biomechanics and how uh, the, the melding of the mind with uh, uh, any kind of implants is, is essentially a way of creating the humans which are better quote unquote but uh it also has its own drawbacks and it, it kind of melds with that idea to just play a, like a straight trailer but because it's like so it ex executed it's still really fun all the characters are like really likable especially like rebecca and uh uh lucy and like uh, david himself is like really charming for an anime protagonist he's like not just uh an angry young man because he's like more uh, uh because of the stuff that happens because he's like really downtrodden in life is is just not just angry he also like wants to prove himself he wants to like achieve dreams for others and it so and it's like really interesting in how he comes into a leader role but also struggles with his own backstory like his back his upbringing does not leave him it, it's such a heavy burden that it still keeps with him and but he also matures in a way so that is interesting. And yeah, the whole thing is like really, just really well presented. And uh, I, 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 I did not, I could not think like it would get this popular because it, this, like the game kind of flopped and it was on Netflix, but it got like really, really popular, like beyond my expectations. So uh, it's nice. And I hope like the public votes it in for us. So I I, um, I noticed that you discussed like this element that there's almost almost two sides of it that there is this uh, socio political element of people humans um, upgrading and uh, modifying themselves but there's also this like um, this main characters that provides the heart to the story and I was wondering if anybody else wants to maybe talk about how the show balances that and whether you think that it does a good job of balancing that. Go on, somebody. Yeah, I can. I can give it a go. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Cyberpunk, yeah, what a what a show. Uh, when the show dropped, I managed to finish it in just a couple of days, and I immediately said, "Well, this is probably the best, best video game adaptation I've seen since Arcane." And it was promptly pointed out to me that Arcane was also in the same year. Uh, and so it's pretty crazy to have two fantastic quality shows um, for video games, which are quite <laughs> another part of my life. Um, 
to have two shows in one year is just amazing. Now, with the relation of the characters in Cyberpunk, having played um, Cyberpunk 2077 and also recently um, the Ask Me Anything over on the Edge Runners, so I bred it by director Emoshi, um, it provided a lot of insight into their thoughts in creating these characters. And so the um, coordination between Trigger and um, CD Projekt Red are both has been one which has definitely paid off because not only do you get the elements which have already been discussed coming through, which are fairly predominant in the cyberpunk universe, or rather in the game universe, um, we also have the struggles of the characters, um, and this is very much related to the continual pressures of upgrading yourself through um, implants and other cyber um, um, opportunities. And so throughout the show, we can see the progression of the effect that all of these things have on the characters being the source of trauma, being the source of um, comfort, being the source of community. And it's just, if you've dived into the lore of the game, it brings an incredible new light into this whole idea of cyberpsychosis and um, just what it means to live in Night City. Thank you for that answer. Um, that was uh, very thorough and very appreciated. Um, uh, I wonder if either Fel or Midas want to speak on Cyberpunk. Um, I'm not sure whether they've seen it um, yet. So, Yeah, I've seen it. I absolutely adore the show as well. Uh, one thing I also really liked was its strong use of color and lighting. Uh, red being the sense of danger and how the different colors and lighting was used to uh, portray the feelings in the scene and how it was used to often portray and mesh together. Uh, let's say uh, one character was green and one was uh, pink, then suddenly they could mesh both colors together as they got closer got together or interacted with each other. So the coloring and lighting on the characters are extremely good. Uh, the soundtrack is also a banger, of course, where it was extremely well used in the scenes for being an already completed uh, soundtrack for a, a video game. So. I'm really surprised with how good uh, they were used as inserts, often playing low in the background on the radio or maybe during some dialogue as underscoring uh, in one of my best episodes before it really ramps up as the progression of the episode ramps up. Can't go into the detail of that episode because it's a spoiler, but... Uh, one thing I also really liked for the show uh, compared to a lot of trigger shows uh, or the one thing that uh, set it apart i love trigger shows but one thing that i think stands out for cyberpunk is its extreme amount of blood gore sex and violence even further than anything else they've gone with it didn't really do it to shock or disgust the viewer either as much as it did it to make it cool and fun uh, but the red color and body parts and the uh, hyper violence in the show was extremely fun to watch uh, when they really got down to it. I mean, as as much as, um, you know, I, I, I did watch uh, some of Cyberpunk and I, I do agree with you that there's this, um, there's a real appeal in watching like the the satisfying gore, which isn't something we get in a lot of anime uh, recently, I don't think, um, but I do think was really present in Cyberpunk and I think it's your absolute right to, to point it out. Um, Thel, I know that this is going to be a bit mean because everyone's just singing praises to the to the show. Um, what is necessarily not so great about the show? Do you have anything that you can maybe point to, to this? Because I mean, I'm sure the viewers um, would appreciate just a little bit of a sense of how people go about in the the jury criticizing the shows that even the great ones. Sure. Uh, well, I quite enjoyed Cyberpunk as well, um, but. Pretty much any show we go through, uh, there's going to be, you know, positive points, negative points. Um, 
there's lots of different avenues too you can look at like you've got the general narrative and a big thing for me nowadays is um you know the the production how did it look how's it sound um so in that regard there's definitely uh some episodes um throughout that shine really bright but others kind of lackluster for me i would probably say Right after Ikarashi's episode, which is number six, there's a couple that aren't as uh, stand out in my eyes, um, which, you know, when you've got a show that's already pretty great and you have to compare it against other ones, um, that can be the deciding factor. You know, if you've got two fantastic shows, one episode being a kind of, you know, not as, as solid and the whole uh, the whole run can bring it down. Um, otherwise. You know, for me, a lot of it is just kind of, did you enjoy the general direction the show took towards the, the end of it? Um, you know, Ikarashi's episode is a, a pretty big turning point for the series. And uh, I know I remember seeing some comments about, um, I wouldn't say predictability, but um, I think Adi mentioned it being sort of like a straightforward show, and it kind of is in a sense. Um, but for some, that couldn't really s- strike home quite well. And maybe some other people were expecting some, you know, more nuance to the presentation. Um, I know with the game in general, Cyberpunk uh, 2077, um, you've got people that adore it because it's like this super big uh, realization of this, like, you know, cyberpunk theme. But then you've got people who are like, this isn't the real cyberpunk I know and love. You know, it's not this whole, like, gritty. And uh, I know we mentioned... Um, all the excessive gore and stuff but for some it could be just sort of like just tipping uh dipping your toes in the water kind of with the whole cyberpunk theme um you know the whole anti like you know fight back against the the corporations and stuff uh kind of comes into play but it's sort of like a an additional side thing on top of uh, the general narrative of the show so in a general sense there's there's definitely like all sorts of things you can kind of poke at uh, with any sort of show. I think cyberpunk excels in a general sense for what it's aiming for, uh, especially as like a short of shorter. So, um, but overall, yeah, I think I liked it a fair amount, but there's definitely things in it that you could point at and be like, that could be improved. Um, or maybe this should have gone a different way. Thank you. That's a, a, a great answer. Um, now I'm going to ask if, few quick uh quick fire questions i'm uh, aware that we have people waiting in the wing to come on and discuss a movie um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask people to give very brief uh very very brief i mean one sentence please um uh, answers to some of the uh, some shows that we've missed that i think uh people in the audience maybe would like us to have at least talked about it just a little uh spy and uh, spy family how do people feel about that storm uh, yeah, I've been enjoying Spy Family as I watch it. The uh, the comedy is pretty consistent, um, but the consistency also means that it's got some pretty some down moments and some up moments, which aren't necessarily great as well. Val uh, looks pretty good for the most part, and uh, it has some funny points. And I like the general family dynamic a lot. I just. Um, I love Anya. She's fantastic, uh, and it's got a really pleasant uh, color palette all around. Both the coloring and um, aesthetic is very pleasant to the eye, easy to watch. Uh, so I really like how it looks, yeah. And Anya as a whole, but I'm not too big on uh, the Yor yet. Maybe she will grow more on me. And Adi. I have not watched too much of the anime. Like, I enjoy the manga, and so I didn't feel like the anime added enough for me to watch more of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that's quite critical in its own way. Um, okay, and then uh, perhaps uh, another one that's uh, quite big and been this year is um, Kaguya-sama. Storm, do you want to give us some thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so the character progression in Kaguya-sama is probably... Uh, it's main highlight for many people this year, uh, but even then, I'm really not that impressed by the um, the writing in general outside of the comedic skits. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not like a, a huge you know stand of Kaguya or anything, but I think it's pretty good. 
Um, I'd say this the season is a little, you know, predictable after this long time we've had with the cast. Um, but it's pretty enjoyable. It, it does hit some bumps on the production front. Uh, there's not as much. Um, it doesn't shine as bright as the previous season, that's for sure. But um, I think it succeeds in the end. Okay, Midas? Uh, I think it's uh, that's a really great job uh, building up on previous jokes and having some jokes that are built up through the entire series, get some twists and punchlines to them. And same with how the romance aspects gets really the forefront this season while also introducing a new fantastic side character uh, that have been in the background a couple of times and that's extremely wild in her animation and the focus on some of the side characters supporting characters uh, are extremely good without mentioning names there is one in particular i really like uh, the direction the show took with her and eddie uh yeah so i think uh it, this is probably the best material the se- show is adapting uh the season but it's uh yeah you can feel that the production uh, is not there but they're trying their like level best like they're being very creative in conserving resources and making the most out of it so it's not as well executed as season two but it's still really fun like one of the most creative shows uh, presented in my opinion Okay, brilliant. And let's do one last more. Uh, one more, just to be um, uh, to, to finish on um, a, a different note. Uh, Sono Bisque Doll, uh, my dress up darling. Uh, Ad, do you want to finish us up with uh, this to start? Uh, I have actually not seen Sono okay. Bisque Doll yet. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. No worries. Midas? Uh, I really like it uh, how uh, Marion and Gojo both fit as characters. The dynamic and chemistry between them feels natural uh, instead of forced, like very many, many epic cigar shows does. Um, the fashion aspect is extremely good. Uh, the clothing designs are quite intricate and they do a great job showing them off and making the clothes part of the show's actual appeal, both the making of the clothes and how she cosplays wearing the clothes. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I quite enjoyed it. Um, it kind of tugs the line along uh, for many people of being sort of that, like, you know, manic sea girl and the, the loser guy. Um, sort of typical romance comedy shows you see, but I think it uh, goes a bit deeper and uh, presents the characters in a really uh, genuine way. And it also has some quite standout visual uh, moments, not all the time, but uh, it it does its best for the most of it. Yeah, uh, for me, very similar to the cell is the genuine nature of the characters and the way that it is portrayed is just so very different for your typical rom-com and that was really refreshing to watch um uh, and well i am partial to a a decent rom-com and that was one of my favorite from this year well thank you everyone for agreeing to come onto the show and i really appreciate all of your thoughts um i know that uh it's been quite a lot of anime that you've already watched and discussed and there's still plenty more to come Hopefully we can have you on a little bit um, later, maybe after your uh, jury writing project uh, to talk to us a bit more. Uh, thank you very much. Please can you mute yourselves and uh, I will uh, kindly demote you while we move on to welcome our new movie uh, guests. Uh, and AD is remaining with us. Um, it's um, He is a an AOTY and a movie juror and has kindly agreed to come on for two. Uh, we are joining, uh, Adi is uh, being joined by Ananas and uh, Orofin. Uh, these are uh, two movie jurors uh, who perhaps can just qu- uh, briefly say hello, Ananas. Howdy. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Uh, Ananas has bought a, a new microphone, so uh, or it's a, a fancy microphone, sorry. Um, so it, it's a all... fancy microphone. It's got, like, lights and stuff. Mm. So we're we're very excited to be hearing a new and crispy uh, pineapple. And Orofin, can you say hello? Hello there. Can now, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, very okay. Well. And how are you doing, Orofin? Uh, I'm doing fine. I have some issues, but it's kind of unrelated to the award, so I'm not going to dwell into it. 
that's fair enough. Um, so how about uh, we we start by uh, just saying, what movies have you guys been watching? Um, I know that obviously with, uh, unlike AOTY, there's a, le- a lot fewer movies that come out every year, but um, there is a quirk with movies, right? That uh, the subtitles, um, we judge based on when the subtitles come out and when the DVD release com- uh, comes out over, uh, sorry, Blu-ray, of course, nowadays, comes out over when the uh, cinema uh, screenings are. So what movies have you been judging? And uh, yeah, what what, uh, what movies have you been watching? Uh, why don't you take us, go ahead, and I see you're unmuted, so. Yeah, so I've, prior to award, the, uh, starting, it was mostly the uh, kind of the earlier, like, franchise movies. So I, I had the chance to see uh, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero in theaters. I got to see... Review Starlight's premiere at Anime Central, which was a lot of fun, and Bell in theaters. And then since the awards, I've been, there's a few movies that I've been watching with a couple other jurors. Uh, so oh, the other franchise movies that I've seen is uh, Gup, the, uh, the, the new Gup movie. So we got Nikoku, Blue, uh, Girls and Blue Panther, Thermal. And just to clarify, yeah, Girls and Panther, for those who are... Uh, the uninitiated. For the uninitiated, Golden <laughs> Panther. Uh, and then a smattering of, of other other movies, Blue Thermal, uh, Drifting Home, etc. But there, there's definitely still a lot on the list to watch. There always is in awards. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Lovely. Yeah, I have only seen... I have not seen much, actually. Uh, the only movie I saw before the awards was The Golden Panther Part 3 uh, of Deluxe Filane. And... Since the awards, I've seen uh, the Tatsukuni no Shoujo movie, which is like an indie Kickstarter thing, which was like really fun. Uh, like it's an adaptation of a manga, and they cre- like create their own storyline, and it's like really interestingly presented. But, like it's, it doesn't look like your usual anime. And I've seen another indie movie, which is Dozens of North, which is like uh, by just like one animator. It's like an hour long movie, and it's like. Uh, it's ex- completely experimental. Like, there's no dialogue. It's like it, subtitles come on the screen, and it's like completely surreal. Uh, the narrative is not like a straightforward narrative. It's like things happen. Uh, like, it's just kind of oppressive all the time, and like there's uh, deaths happening, and there's like insane shit happening. And yeah, you just go with the flow of it. It's it's, it's that kind of movie. But I've basically only seen like the more out there stuff right now. But I. I'm yeah. I'm more hyped to see uh, like review and Inwo when it comes out and like Bell because Bell looks good. I have heard it's not that good, but it looks great, and I hope public picks it up for us. Arafin, why don't you uh, say what you've been watching? Well, I'm almost caught up to everything that come up in this category. Like when it started, I watched like when the award started, I watched around. Uh, like Radio Starlight, some franchise movies like Jujutsu Kaisen, uh, some like Hero Academia, like this general. But uh, this month I was basically catching up to everything that's in the category. So I watched almost everything. A lot of like franchise and not franchise movies came out, like Band Dream movies, Fate movies, Free Even movie, like general movies like uh, uh, Dear King, like uh, uh, Nikuko, for example. I, I haven't seen Still Dozens of North that Adi talked about. Uh, and I haven't seen new Shinshan movie that's also eligible. But uh, I'm trying to, like, cut up to everything, see what what is going to be, like... You, you also actually. haven't seen... The most important movie, which is the Aikatsu Planet movie. I haven't seen Aikatsu Planet as well, because it's it's half of live action movie as far as I know. So I'm not sure about it. I, I, I think that nobody would uh, would begrudge you not having seen that, because uh, looking at, at what everyone's watched, apparently nobody's watched it. So I'm, um, I'm working my way through the theories. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine it takes quite a long time with with quite a lot of prereqs to get through to to make it to. It's it's standalone. You are, I mean, I mean, I got spoiled to standalone, but you still have like TV series. But generally, I don't even. I'm not sure if you even need TV series for this movie. Maybe it's 
like understandable that way. So, well, because... yeah, but then you're missing out on Ikatu Planet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so to 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 move to to a slightly meta question because I think we've already hit to one of the the core difficulties in the movie category, which is you have a lot of things that are uh, sequels to long running seasons. And then you also have these standalone movies uh, that, like, we have your Bell, uh, Dozens of Norths, uh, your Drifting Homes. And these are obviously a, quite a, a different a type to the ones that are building on a long running series, like the Area of Bell and Cup, Bells and Panzer. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you guys uh, compare these? And how do you feel about, uh, how do you, like, from a meta point of view, what, what do you do to try and to break down the, the comparison? Because obviously, the the aim of a a series uh, isn't uh, for a film isn't necessarily going to be to introduce new characters. So, wh where do you where do you begin with that sort of difficulty? Uh, I I think I go with the same approach for everything in media. It's like what is the media trying the piece of work trying to do and how it is succeeding in it. Like something like the Girls in Panzer movie it, that is trying to be pure fan service. It, it like if you if you are not into the ethos of Girls in Panzer, you're not gonna enjoy Das Finale Part Three, right? So and it, it, and it hits all the beat what beats of what the fans expect. And so if you are like a fan of that and if it works that well on that department that is what i like preferred like see it as and like basic competency on like you know technical levels and how how the plot is structured and stuff like that that you can compare universally but even then uh the goals of the movies are different so you have to judge it by what the goals are and, and i at least try to judge it at what the goals are and like meet the movie at what it's trying to present that as opposed to like fit it into a and and when it comes to comparison, it's mostly about enjoyability as opposed to comparing them directly one on one. I feel, yeah, yeah. I don't know how do you guys think about this. Yeah, go, uh, that's that's a it's a good explanation. Um, yeah, I think that's a good explanation. Uh, I would I would add that you you do I feel like you kind of have to with with franchise movies divorce how you feel about the franchise from how you feel about the movie because like an example which I haven't actually had this chance to see the Princess Principal movies yet. I've heard mixed things. I loved the main series, though. So, you know, just because, but just because you absolutely love the characters in the main series, the movie, you can't judge the movie in movies based on how much you love the main series, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately. Yeah, that is true. I mean, the first Princess Prince movie was like really bad, and I love the show as well. So, yeah, I don't know how the second one is, but I've heard it's kind of better, but we'll see. I've I've heard better things. I've also heard that's a low bar. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, well, like, there is obviously exists the franchise bias for the movies. When you like the franchise, you expect them to like the movie because it has like your favorite characters. It has something you're already familiar with, so you you're watching it basically just for that to experience this world, these characters again. But at the same time, uh, I feel like we actually, uh, we also hit in trouble with the franchise movies. There is like two types of franchise movies. One is the like standalone franchise movies, which are kind of spin-offs to the original series that you can watch knowing the characters and all. And there are other types that coming up recent years which are basically a series the, the, which break uh, which is broken to the parts like the girls and panzer is like that the prince principle that they're talking about is like that so you basically ended up with the part of a whole story you're not even getting the full story in the movie itself you're just getting a part of it so it's even harder to judge because you're only looking not in the full picture. You're looking at, you're basically judging it almost similarly as you're judging like few episodes of anime on its own and not like an overall story. And this is also like like um, making a problem to how you approach it comparatively to something that's already finished and already complete and how much it managed to achieve in the 
its short li- uh, lifespan. And, yeah, that, uh, I think that can be an advantage too. Like for a standalone movie, like it's telling a complete narrative. I think that is sometimes an advantage. Uh, so it's like uh, there is the familiarity advantage in the franchise films, but there's that standalone advantage that like of a f- complete vision that comes through, which can only come through unless if you like completely reimagine the series. Like uh, I, I have heard that the Review Starlight movie does something like that. But yeah, so... Like, a Review Starlight movie is slightly different because it's it's a standalone movie that's a continuation of the series. So it works yeah. on its own, but at the same time, it uh, requires you to watch the series. So you have kind of like the third... Uh, the third uh, type. It's of similar to... It, you have like... I would say... You know, like, that have... Like uh, finished story, something like, like for example, My Hero Academia movie. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't you you have to be familiar with the story, with the characters, but it's like the story that works on its own. And you have something like uh, serious movies, which like The Girls and Panzer and Princess Principal, and you also have something like uh, like continuational prequels or sequels to the series. It's not just like Review Starlet. You have something like. Uh, for example, what we have, like free like, uh, or like uh, uh, yeah. Queen's movie as well, the same. So it's basically the finale for the series. You know, it, it does like you feel like watching, um, like the uh, the Revy movie feels like an ending to Revy, whereas uh, Revy already had an ending, but another ending to Revy. Whereas Gup is weird because. For a lot of the uh, the Gup death finale movies, you're ending off sometimes in the middle of matches, and it's like so. And so you might have like really good setup for interesting things, but you don't know what the payoff is yet. You you don't know if the payoff's going to be worth it yet because we can't. We we only have death finale part three. We don't have parts four, five, six to look at. So you kind of have to. You kind of have to look at parts, and you're not judge. And one and two are not eligible. So it's this kind of tension of. Y- y- the middle part two is they are like the worst in this in this sense because like the, the first movie it's kind of the setup so you kind of see where the story is going and so on and the final movie is like the payoff so it's right. a climax you have like you have the f- sense of finality but the middle yeah, movies yeah, they're yeah, the middle. worst in that kind because yeah. they don't have like r- real a real beginning and they don't have real ending so you ended up you in the middle of the story. Like... story. Gup kind of, uh, like, at least this movie kind of transcends that because of how it is structured. Like, this specific movie is starting at a point where, like, there's a specific beginning and it ends at the end of a match. And, like, we see a, a couple of other matches. So it's, like, it basically, like, two matches combined into one movie. And in that way, there is, like, a there's more finality to it as compared to, like, the last part, which, like, ended in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you're right. So, uh, so this I think it works better in that way. So, like, yeah, we can say that there is more to come, but it works as is. At least to me, it, like, really worked uh, as compared to the first two parts, which felt like it ended in the middle of nowhere. This felt a bit more substantial in that part. Yeah, it, yeah, I think definitely, definitely, part three is better because I, I was on movie jury when we had a uh, definitely part two up, and it was kind of the weird, weird problem of I, I like this, but like, it's it's really not its own thing because it's stuck blended between what's coming next and what's coming before. So, Yeah, like the Prisma Ilya movie, it's basically continuing the story from the previous movie and it's also end, ends on a cliffhanger as well. Kind of like the good movie, but even the worst kind. So this is like the, the, like the epitome of the middle movie that has some sort of continuation of the story, but you have to wait and see. I, I was just wondering if you had, because obviously uh, the the there is a, been a trend in anime over time towards more of these uh, TV shows finishing up with movies, um, and TV shows uh, moving having these like movie inserts that I don't think was even present maybe that much five years ago, six years ago when the awards started. So I was wondering if if maybe uh, you had feelings on how uh, this changes uh, the the sort of the way that a movie has to be judged. Because obviously, I'm guessing it means that there's a lot more prerequisites that have to be covered. I know that last year there was um, uh, 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 Gintama's... Uh, very, last very year was season. way worse than that. Mm-hmm. Because last year have some heavy hitters. It has Gintama, it has 
like Gundam, all of that. It has uh, what else was there? Like big one. It has Fate, oh, yeah. uh, and not like Fate Heaven's Feel movie that requires like all the roots and all stuff. But it it not uh, exactly, but still. Uh, so it I, was I, kind I of think... was kind of. I think this has been an issue since the start of the wars, though. Like, uh, the first year, we had Kizumalo no Gatsui Part 1 and 2 as a combined entry. So this has always been a thing. It's just that it has increased as a thing in the industry. And it's getting worse because movies are not movies anymore. And it's like, uh, they're just TV episodes played in theaters. Like, you have the Bunny Girl movie and stuff like that. Even the upcoming Kaguya movie is just going to be a TV episode, but longer. So yeah, uh, as the standards for what a movie is gets lower, you have uh, issues like, in defining what a movie is and judging what a movie is. Uh, on, on that note, then, yeah. and, and, uh, Stan, unless it looks like you've just dropped out of um, the uh, Reddit's uh, call, by the way, if you would like to rejoin. And uh, while you do that, um, uh, I, uh, I would just like to ask, then, uh, on the note of production, um, Am I... You're saying that, yes, you're back. Um, okay. The production has uh, changed, as you're saying, for movies in the, a lot of them are becoming like TV. And I know that you're like quite a, a, a Skuga nerd. And so you have like all of the production knowledge there, um, AD. So can you say, does this actually mean that these uh, movies are being produced like TV episodes and then just uh, made into movies? Or is it that they still follow a movie production pipeline? Just with uh, lower budgets or uh, lower. Well, um, the thing is, uh, movies have always been made as TV episodes. Like they were like uh, instead of episode directors, you have unit directors. The the thing about high prestige uh, movies used to be that only one or two at most people used to storyboard the whole movie, and then the management of it was divided into two multi people, multiple people, and then you had like a director on top. So that has always been a thing, but uh, I think you can argue f at least from the Haruhi movie, where it has become more and more, like Haruhi movie is like really cinematic, I'm not uh, taking shots at it, it's just that from that point on you can argue that. Yeah, I think the Haruhi movie been... was like the big shift towards, shift towards, because it was quite popular, it was quite successful at the time. So other studios started to see it as, like, the way to do things. And then you yeah. have something like Kimetsu no Yaiba comparatively recently. And it's even, yeah. it's, it led to even more of that. Yeah, as soon as, like, Yaiba became the hit that it became, uh, the movie industry has basically become, uh, like, the Kimetsu no Yaiba movie is basically a TV episode, but longer. So, and it became a massive hit. So at this point, everybody's like, we just have to put our TV episodes on the theater and we are going to make huge amounts of money. So let's do that instead of like making proper movies. Because there's only one company that is distributing movies at this point, which is Toho and nobody else. So, and Toho only has like a few handful of directors, like there's Hasuda, there's Shinkai, there was Yuasa, Yuasa is not gone, now gone, but like Yamada is taking over the mantle for Yuasa at Sain Saru. Uh, there's obviously Ghibli, uh, like that is going to end with Miyazaki's last movie. Then there is uh, Studio Ponak, which is actually quite struggling because of uh, Miyazaki making his last movie. So they had like a movie in the pipeline, but that's not, uh, that's been delayed because Miyazaki started his own movie. Then there's Studio Kara, which has like their, which are also making like theatrical movies, and then Studio 4C. But it's like it's very limited. Like the theatrical space has always been very limited, and but because they want volume at the theater as well, you have to essentially bring t TV and to the movie the theaters, and that's it. So on that note, um, I think maybe it's worth moving a little to discussing some of the particular. Uh, ones that people have seen. I, I know that uh, both Orofin and Anna said that they've seen Bell. Um, so perhaps we can have a little talk about that. I know that Bell is quite a, a popular anime, but it's also been a little bit controversial in its use of CG. Um, so maybe if you, um, if you two can have a little bit of a, a, a discussion about how is Bell? How does it look? Is this a, a is does it look good? Is it does it work well as a movie? Oh, I think it looks great, and I think it sounds great. Uh, it, to me, Bell's weakness is its plot and pacing. Uh, I don't yeah, know I don't. Think, that. 
Yeah, I don't think you can call a Hasada movie which like it looks bad. Like the CG in Bell is like really nice. Uh, it's it, like from what I've seen of the clips and the, like the trailers and the Sakuboru, the Sakuboru clips and stuff like that, the movie looks impeccable. And it like it at least to me the aesthetic is a lot more palatable than the Shinkai's of the world. So I I don't think you can like dig the movie on that. It's more the plot which is controversial. It's specifically uh, like I've heard things about kidnappings and stuff which I'm, I'm going to talk about but yeah I would say that is the controversial aspect as opposed to CG I'd say the CG is not like the most controversial aspect of this movie because like CG you kind of have to get used to I'm not really a big fan of Hosoda approach to the virtual world I would like it to be like in Summer Wars because it would just look much better for me in Summer Wars uh, I understand what it, what he's going for, especially with the sense of scale, which it creates, especially at the first, like, at the opening shots when the first song plays and when you see this world for the first time. It really portrayed this sense of scale quite nice. Also, with some other set pieces in the middle of the movie, I understand what, what he's going for and why he chose this particular... Uh, aesthetic to portray it but at the same time i more enjoyed actual hand-drawn aspects of the movie and stuff that happened outside of the virtual world and basically of the virtual world plot i feel like he managed to make some good uh human characters with the secondary characters and also with the main lead but when it comes to the utilization of the virtual world setting, when it comes to the world building in general, and uh, some aspects towards the ending of the movie and how to, to the resolution of the main conflict, I don't want to spoil too much because uh, it kind of follows the formula of uh, Beauty and the Beast. He, like he kind of making his own Beauty and the Beast, but with a twist, I'd say. With, with a twist, and how this twist was uh, actually resolved, uh, I wasn't a big fan of that. Yeah, I think that the pacing is is definitely, I, I, I kind of had an issue. I, it, it felt a little choppy, and I didn't find the villain to be, I mean, the villain of, of, of Bell is essentially a Discord mod. Like, I don't even think about <laughs> him as the villain. Yeah, he that just, sounds awesome. He's just kind of there to be an obstacle more. Like, it's less about the fighting against the villain or even against the system. It's more about, like, the character growth and the character uh, relationship, right. I'd say. Yeah. Uh, the villain is uh, he's just uh, one of the obstacles. Like, they introduced another... I'm not even, call, I'm, I'm not even gonna call it the villain but another conflict kind of towards the end and how it was resolved i really disliked like yeah the last moment i was just not a big fan of that and i also like, feel like some of the, some of the secondary characters were not utilized quite well like the, the scene about the beast in general like the idea was to make uh, like the beauty and the beast but in reverse so to make the bell, the girl, more active and the beast kind of like more, not reactive, but gi give him less agency. And I don't feel like it was, it was a good, not that it's not a good idea. I don't like how it was generally presented. It felt for the most part that he ended up being more like a plot device to a degree and less as a full flesh character. Like we learned something about his characterization and how, why he's like that and the reasoning behind it. But I feel like it would have been more, it would have been better if we didn't learn about it in like, in this expositionary manner, which as it was presented and more through the character interactions. Like, there was a character interaction at first, and but then it was more, oh, so this is how it is, uh, this is what's, what the reasoning behind uh, all this character, the beast, and why he's like that. 
On that note, I, I was just wondering if you, uh, if if it is it one of these things where do you feel that these sorts of elements um, being uh, re- how they are resolved uh, is you're saying they're not really in villain, but they just end up being used as like a set piece as a as a piece of conflict. Um, obviously, a movie is a, a movie. Uh, Bell is quite one of the longer movies that you have. It's about two hours long. Um, is that something where um, you find that the villain being presented in such a, a shallow way really impacts? Uh, your enjoyment overall or do you think that if you can buy into the villain anyway and it's a suspension of disbelief uh, because i know that sometimes it can just be that, that if you accept you know like i watch christmas films with my mum, and they're all pretty crap but if you sit down and you just accept that you're going to be watching something pretty crap some of them are kind of fun they have elements that the hallmark ones obviously um i'm just uh, you know if you accept the pretty crap and you know what the formula is it's okay you enjoy sit down and enjoy it is it like that here where if you accept the formula and buy into it you know it's sort of a fairy tale uh, story it's still fun it's still a fun ride or do you think that it, it negatively enhances it impacts it completely I mean, it's a musical movie, so it's pretty fun by default. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, and, and the music, the music is fantastic. Yeah, I don't have issue with the music, and if you accept it as a fairy tale fun movie, it can work that way. But I feel like some issues it's trying to tackle, like more serious issues, especially towards the end. Uh, I cannot buy the way it resolved. It was too uh, idealistic. To the point that you kind of don't buy it. So, I mean, you can buy it and assume that, yeah, it can work that way. But the way it presented it and how it kind of glossed over everything at the end, like everything got resolved, everything got right and great. <laughs> yeah. uh, I feel like you have to maybe waste at least like a few more minutes on it to properly conclude it and not just well, we we kind of deal with it and move on. Like here is mm-hmm. the end of your movie. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I think my 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 walking out like initial take on Bell was basically like I I had fun, but like this is this feels like it's trying to be too many different movies at once. Okay. By the way, if anybody here disagrees and actually likes this movie, please vote for it. I do not want to watch more franchise movies. Please vote for original movies. Uh, people like funny, funny aside for it. It, to uh, to what dance. Dance was saying about you know if you uh, if you just suspend your disbelief and embrace the formula. There actually has been a movie like that for me in movies, and that has been Blue Thermal, which I'm still on the fence about whether I, I it, it's good. But it's it feels very much like a when it's focusing on the gliders and the sports aspect because it, it's a it's basically a sports movie about gliders, and it. There are definitely beats where it's like, yeah, this is just this is just the sports movie formula, and I love that. That's that's fun. There are there are also issues though, and I guess there is kind of the issue of well, we are in movie. We're trying to like gauge these critically as well, so it's kind oh, yeah. of hard to just like blindside yourself, even if you're willing to suspend your disbelief in watching it, especially mm-hmm. when it's it's kind of it can be for. You know, a lot of our entries are quite good, so it can be a, a kind of a game of inches. So, and I guess that comes back a lot to what we were discussing right at the very beginning, which is uh, to what extent do you go? And as Adi, as Adi was saying, you know, that the that he likes to look at it from the perspective of uh, what are they trying to setting out to achieve, and do they achieve it? But of course, that can maybe only go so far if you, they set out to achieve something and you don't think it's fun, you don't enjoy it. Um, so I think that it might be worth. Uh, uh, taking a few questions from the audience. Uh, if people um, have throw their uh, questions into the comments box, we can uh, we can come to them. Um, I see that somebody has asked, uh, "What are the, their thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on One Piece re- uh, film Red?" I don't know if um, it's been it's subtitled been sub- and. Uh, that's, it's that's not, not available. Be I think it's yeah, not, it's, it's not as of yet eligible. I mean, it's not eligible. Like some people have seen it in theaters, but yeah, like for the general, I, I don't think the, awards the Blu-rays come out for like ages. Like it, it won't come out till next year easily. I don't think so. this is happening. The the only one which I have hopes for, which comes out in like a couple of days, is like a Gaki-san movie and like Inoo. And I think those are the two main ones which I know of. But yeah, it's, it's quite unlikely that One Piece Film Red is gonna be eligible. Um, and while some more questions uh, come in, 
I, I guess uh, I will uh, ask uh, a brief question, which is, um, I see that uh, both, uh, the two of you have watched uh, the review Starlight movie. Um, how is it? Like, what's the uh, was it was it worth the watch? It's I know it's another another uh, franchise movie, but I I think I think it's very worth the watch. I review review is probably at this point my top movie in the category. I would say pretty pretty emphatically. Um, okay, so uh, I have a I have a question from from the Twitch stream as well, um, which is: uh, Have you got an aria uh, an aria gif? Um, oh wait, sorry. Uh, is that actually the question? I don't understand that question. It's... Um, no, there was a different question uh, earlier. Okay. Sorry, that was an early question. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, so. What are the winners currently? And I think that's mostly asking what's currently. I guess the favorites for the category amongst y'all. Um, what do you What do you uh, feel like is uh, something? I feel that... like people have not watched enough yet to have favorites. But I would say it is likely gonna be you know oh for the people who have seen it and review for the people who have seen it. So at least from that buzz, I feel these two would be on a different level to everything else we have. But we'll see. Yeah, it, it yeah. does kind of feel like those are the two that are kind of duking it out for first right now. But the, the problem is, of course, you know, people like me, I, I haven't seen Inuo, and I haven't, I didn't I have to get the chance to see it in theaters, and it's not available yet, so maybe I'll like Inuo I'll a lot. Like, I, can... I have not seen either of them. So it's, like, fine. I, and and I guess that I'm gonna I'm gonna because Ananas was very keen to mention this uh, this one earlier before we came on uh, onto this the, the stream, which is how do you feel about drifting home? Um, uh, drifting home. I, okay, I I don't hate drifting home. <laughs> it's, it's it's drifting home is one of our longer movies. I think it was what two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, it. I think not two hours feel... is like the norm. For most of the movies right now, even for like the franchise yeah, movies, they're kind of uh, stretching it out for two hours. Like yeah, Eurocamp yeah, yeah. movie was two hours long. Jesus like, Christ! And it's Eurocamp. Yeah, you, you I think nine. Forest fires? No, uh, I think it was. It used to be ninety, but yeah, it is inching towards one twenty minutes recently uh, for animated movies. We we'll see. Drifting Home is one of those movies where one I I don't think it needed to be two hours though I I, I don't I don't think that they had two hours of um I don't think it had two hours worth of things to say and it that's that's the that's the it's one of those movies where at least for me I was you know you'll be an hour in and it'll be like okay I, I, I'm still not quite sure what this movie's about like wh where are we I going feel like for me though this movie was quite understandable from the start what it's all about this was an issue for this movie like this is a movie from uh about like uh ba basically about dealing with loss and uh, uh moving on from like not tuck into the, in, into your past and move on this is mostly what it's all about like they have to move from their home literally, but they don't, they don't want it. And there is a girl which has like which cannot move on from some some tragedy happened to her, partially to her, and to and their their relationship. So uh, and everything else like they they somehow teleported to this area when there is just a sea and a home, and they drift in there. For a while, so it turned out into your island disaster movie, or what should mm -hmm. I call it? When you're Maybe stuck 2. in, 2. yeah, like you're stuck into the uh, in the island and trying to survive for for a while. Lord of the Flies, yeah, yeah. Ki ki it's not even Lord of the Flies because there is not much uh, there is not much active conflict between the characters. It's mostly just here is your bunch of kids. They're like in the middle of nowhere, and they have to somehow get back home, and they don't know how. Like something like Sony Boy did in in the last year, but Sony Boy was less about even them surviving, but mostly about them figuring out what what is going on with with them and with the world around them. It's okay. more like concrete in this movie. Like you have find food you have to like come up with the way you're gonna live in this 
home, you have to deal with some issues when sometimes it's starting to like flood in and all of that. Yeah. So and they're they're dealing with more like practical issues toward the, toward this movie. But I feel like for me uh, there was like two major issues with this movie. First, I feel like the characters were acting slightly older their age. Maybe it's my issue comes down from the seiyus because most of the seiyus that plays characters, there are quite famous seiyus with quite well-known voices. So if you know them, you kind of immediately associate, oh, this is Ayana Sakura, oh, this is uh, like Tamura Matsumi and so on. So you, you hear this type of voice acting many times in different characters before. So when I hear them here, I immediately thinking about that it's not exactly fitting and their characterization as well, their portrayal of these kids, because they're like around 13 age, but I feel like they act in around 16 and some, some of them at least. Uh, and the second issue, that the practical issues they're dealing with through most of the movie, they're not that engaging to watch, I'd say. So you're expecting some like drifting home it's it's been something like more creative in a sense, but the way they approach this drifting, it's quite not as exciting as you might expect. Mm -hmm. Unengaging, would you say? Yeah, just... and I, I, I kind of to what Orphan was saying earlier. I I think there were some some ideas in that movie that I actually that I was playing with that I thought were actually really interesting, like this idea of you know, our connection to the places that are important to us. Uh, but the, as I from think, the, the kind of, like, A-plot surface level, like, what's going on in the movie, how they kind of conveyed those themes that expressed them, it, it just wasn't the most engaging. It, even, if, even if there are some interesting ideas there, and, and I mean, this idea of loss and all that, I mean, that's done, that's been done, plenty of times elsewhere and that's not to say that you can't have a phenomenal movie about loss come out even with all that in the past but if you're not telling the story in a way that's especially interesting or especially engaging and again i don't hate drifting home i i thought it was a fine movie but when you're looking at okay what are the best movies that came out in 2022 to me that it, it, it wasn't enough to to make that bar I mean, it looks quite decent, so it has like the decent production because it's Studio Colorido, and it's the most one of the most complete movie, I'd say. And in general, I don't have that many pro issues with like pacing wise. I mean, it can be like slightly shorter, maybe, but compared to some other movies, when I watched it and thinking, oh, they like uh, it's a manga adaptation, so they bumped like around like 40, 50 chapters of manga in like two hours movie and you could feel it. Here, because it's a movie that the script was written for it, like for the movie script and you feel it. So there is a clear idea of the, the movie script. There is beginning, middle and end. And I prefer something like that compared to something like the, the manga adaptation when they just wanted to cram as much as possible into this runtime and it not working for me as well yeah you def like you definitely had that problem with i mentioned earlier the movie blue thermal is you know a manga adaptation yeah yeah i was talking about the tech like, like in general in but yeah but like there are definitely movies this year that have that specific problem and you know sure i i felt that drifting home dragged a bit but it, you definitely when you're hitting that inverse problem it can it can often be you know even worse because you know, you'll have characters who are like okay I, I get that I'm I'm supposed to care about this character, uh, but so I I would say that Drifting Home had had some 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 of the supporting cast in Drifting Home definitely felt kind of underutilized to me too though. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there were characters where it's like okay you know I yeah there is this point uh, uh, I agree that there are some supporting cast like they just mostly for the numbers I feel like. Yeah, they were they were just there to fill out fill out fill out the yeah other because group, we need group. we need the strong boy on the team so we have the strong boy on the team 
does it do anything besides being a strong boy? Not really. Yeah, so he's, he's kind just kind of like there. that. It's not like it's it's not the worst because, but at the same time, you feel like maybe you can do something more with it. Mm-hmm. So, it, does, it, it, it it's like you know you're not being super economical with your cast at that point. Mm-hmm. Like, it, there, there are worse problems. Like if if you have a character who, you know, is is underdeveloped and yet critical, then it's like okay, th- this is actively an issue for the movie's way of expressing its theme. But also, like, I would say this is still an issue itself. So I'm going to ask you to, to wrap up with one last question, and I'm going to ask to be kind of brief because uh, it is quite late. We've uh, we've gone for about an hour and a half now. Um, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. Um, have either of you have any of you watched it and if so what do you think about it um i see that i, I did actually yes uh ananas and orvin have watched it i don't know if you have ad i so i i, I watched it and this, this was a while back because I, I watched it back when it was in theaters here in the u.s um and i i enjoyed it quite a bit uh it is it, it's your fairly normal shonen fair uh I I I would say that I enjoyed it probably probably more than the main series actually it uh, I I would also argue that it it has the funniest joke in Jujutsu Kaisen uh, but what g- joke? generally I liked it hmm? what joke I don't remember uh, there's a joke there's one joke where Panda is uh is does something and uh, I think Maki oh like, yeah, like, yeah I don't yeah. Get, I don't care about sights I'll uh, I-, I will kill you. And oh yeah, I the remember movie that. told it funnier than I could, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So Jujutsu Kaisen Zero is like basically a typical shonen movie plot. I mean, um, it's different from the series because the main character is different, and because of that, it kind of have slightly different dynamic between the main character of the Zero to the characters that we know from the series. So you have, like, appearance of other characters, you know. But other than that, it follows, like, uh, your typical scenario where the main character joins the team of this, like, teams that killing demons, and we, like, training for some time. Then we kind of meet in the bad guy, and the bad guy wants to attack their place, and there's, like, the big action battle at the end. It's looks fine for like action series there is a lot of well animated battles pretty much like in the series slightly better in in some degrees because it's still like theatrical release but i'd say something like my hero my hero academia as well has a lot of and i like this movie those that movie action scenes slightly better but it's like apples and oranges pretty much Mm -hmm. so it's okay if you enjoy like your typical action shown and mm-hmm. there well, is. one one thing that I saw mentioned um in the comments earlier was the OST uh, the original soundtrack um the OST um I don't obviously uh if you've not watched it recently this might be a bit hard for you to to recall what the how you felt about the OST whether you thought it was uh, worked well um or whether it was better than equivalent uh, films. But as I saw it mentioned in our thread, I was hoping that somebody would be able to to comment on that. If you can't, Uh, that's fine. I don't remember much from the... I Like, I don't remember much from the series and from the movie as well. It's not stuck, like, not immediately stuck on you, like some others. Yeah, which is to say, you know, as far as I can recall, it wasn't, you know... I, I don't remember it very well, so I don't know if it would stand out, but it, it it presumably wasn't awful either. Yeah, it didn't it didn't strike you as terrible, which you know. <laughs> yeah, but no, to get to go and uh, kind of to add on to what Addy's point at the beginning was, what you know, does the Jujutsu Kaisen Zero do what it sets out to do, which is, you know, give you kind of a you know, your your normal shonen fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It it accomplishes its ambitions. Now how do those? How does that product stack up against you know, the other movies this year? We'll see, and I think we will see because I can't see a world where Jujutsu Kaisen is not one of our public nominees. Uh, so, okay, and then one last question, just to finish us up. Um, you know, we don't have the sound design award um, as a as a as a category nomination as a uh, as a as a full category anymore. Uh, so, 
I guess the question would be, has, uh, which film, if any, do you think really stands out for its uh, sound, uh, sound design? Um, and by sound design, I mean the, the non-OST use of noise and non-acting uh, use of noise. Yeah, I would definitely say Dozens of North. It's a very unconventional film, and the whole sound design of it is, like, really harrowing. Like, it's... It, it's it, I don't think you would find something like that in regular anime. It's, like... The, 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 the OST is, like, a randomly taken uh, record from, like, the 80s or some shit, and they have just put the sound... Uh, they put a, like, really... Uh, Every sound which is happening in the silence of that OST is very... You can feel it in your bones. It's kind of like that. It's, like, really powerful, really emphatic stuff. So I would definitely recommend it if you enjoy sound design. I mean, Girls in Panzer was always, like, really have really strong sound designs when it comes to, like, all the shell hitting and all the uh, different sounds when it comes to, like, different terrains. They... Uh, they ride in over the course of their matches. So it was always stuck me quite hard when it comes to like immerse, immersing you into these battles, not just in terms of like in general storyboard and the like camera movements and so on, because there is a lot of POV shots and, and that, but also in terms of how it used like different sounds of different um, different tongues and so on. So this is one thing. And another thing that I was thinking about, surprisingly, is uh, the second Fate movie, actually. It's kind of controversial because, like, the Fate... Um, uh, what is... Uh, can, you, can you tell Camelot, me what the Camelot, actual, yeah. full name of this but is? Because I know when quite a lot of Fate comes, films. Yeah. <laughs> Because when it comes to, like, especially the second half, when there are different battles happening at the same time, like uh, the directors of this director of this movie, he basically gave an animator direct their their action scenes. So not, they're not just storyboarding it, but they even coming up with like, the soundtrack and sound design as well. So there are some usage, interesting usage of some sound effects and some uh, and some OST as well in this movie in the second half and the battle happening. This is another thing that kind of. I remember. So, Ananas, do you have anything that you would like to mention? Yeah. For, sound for me, sound design is, it's, you know, it, it, it's a similar problem to the OST, where it's like, for the movies that it's been a while, uh, it's kind of hard to remember which one stands, really stood out. I've got, I think, Girls and Panther is a really good example. And it's a, it's, a, it's a good example of a movie that, where due to the subject matter, I mean, tanks and tank battles are very loud, uh, very loud thing. So it's one of those where the sound design really can shine. Uh, I don't have a particularly good answer other than other than that. I, but I think it, it, the, the little things like sound design are definitely something that is important to look at, especially when you're comparing movies that are like, okay, these are both very good, but, but which one is better? It, mm-hmm. th- that's that's the core question that we all, we have to come to the answer to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's very true. And so, anyway, I, I'm actually gonna uh, I'm gonna say that we should wrap this up now. And so, I'm gonna going to ask if uh, anybody, any of you, have any last uh, remarks that you would like to get to. Because uh, here, this is your moment. I'm not sure if you're gonna get to to come back on as movie of the year uh, jurors to come and talk to us again later in the the season. Uh, so, have is there anything that you wanted to talk about but not had a chance to? Ananas. I I think I've gotten to shill all 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 of all of all of the shows that I mm-hmm. uh, watch. Review that that that's my advice my advice for the viewers is, is watch Review Starlight, the, <laughs> the show and the movie, both phenomenal, strong recommendation, and vote for it for public so that we can uh mm-hmm. yeah, so that you can save the slot. Uh, then Orifin, do you have anything that you you want to talk about that we've not had a chance to mention? I don't even know. I pretty much said everything. I don't want oh. like yeah, I'm as well agree with Ananas that Review Starlight movie was really special experience, I'd say. Some probably think that it's leaning too much on like being just a spectacle, 
with reviews and such, and it mm -hmm. has nothing else to offer besides being that. But I feel like it's really interesting even just for that, because there is pretty much not much like that you're going to see in recent years for sure. And I hope like you know come up in time as well because I'm really interested in this movie from everything I've heard about it. So I hope we we managed to so nominate too. it. It's it's always nice year. when something gets into the to the awards when we we've been waiting for it uh, with bated breath. Uh, I think that we were we were in a similar position this time last year with Pompo where um we we were waiting for it to, the subs to drop and we knew that they could happen almost any day. So hopefully we, we we do get in your in time. Um, Ad, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I will again say please vote Bell for Movie of the Year. So I do not have to share it in the category. And please vote for Cyberpunk and Liquorous Recoil and Boti for Anime of the Year. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much, Ad, for taking uh, this time out of your day to come and speak to us. Um, now this has been the. Uh, everything that we have wanted to talk about. However, uh, I, I'm aware that, well, I say I'm aware, uh, I have a few extra things that I want to say. Um, they're really all pretty minor things, uh, but I really just want to, A, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, it's been great to have uh, so many people come out. Uh, secondly, I'm going to uh, mention that we have a jury writing project that's going to be coming out at some time this weekend. Uh, perhaps, Stuck, do you want to come and just have a quick word and talk to us about um, the jury writing project and say uh, what it's about? Yeah. Uh, so the jury discusses uh, project is mostly sort of um, a written uh, discussion between jurors where it's a post that we sort of have the jury display their various opinions about a show, answering questions that the hosts come up with. And this is mostly to sort of show people this is how the jury discusses these anime. Uh, these are things that they think about. Um, I believe that tomorrow is when it is dropping. Uh, okay. Should be sometime in the sometime in the morning for those uh, in North America. Or so early afternoon in, in Europe yeah. and late at night in Asia. Yeah, well, of course. I guess um, East Asia. It'll be late at night, but it could be any time of day in Asia. It's quite big. <laughs> yeah, like not not a hundred percent sure on that, but I think that's the current plan. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I guess a little spoiler. Uh, it's the comedy category, and I believe they're talking about Bochi the Rock. So uh, go and check that out. Uh, I know that. They're pretty excited to talk about the show, and I hope that everyone can engage with those uh, that post and the questions they ask. Uh, I think that their uh, host, Mirna, came up with some really fun questions for that category. Mm -hmm. and I think, I, that I think will, so, too. Yeah, I think that that will uh, help. Oh, I, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, and people should be sure to drop comments and questions that they have, because uh, we'll be back this time next week uh, to be... Uh, for another uh, discussion. We do not have a specific guarantee of which uh, juries will be coming on yet, uh, but there is a good chance that we'll have at least one person to be able to answer questions um, from the comedy category to be able to talk about what they uh, what they discuss, what they like, uh, um, maybe uh, clarify some of the things they write about. I think that it's um, we're very excited and happy to see people getting engaged with these uh, jury writing projects, and so we would love to. Um, and Finally, just one little thing: there is a uh, a uh, there is a suggestion box on the uh, anime awards dot um, uh, There is a suggestion box that allows you to submit anything that you think we should be watching, and maybe uh, you have an idea of what you think uh, comedy, action, or anime of the year, or movie of the year, or background art should be looking at, and you haven't uh, and we haven't mentioned it. And if we haven't do not despair because there is this suggestion box and you should check the website and drop in any suggestions that you have. Uh, we're always happy to receive them. Um, and on that note, I'm going to uh, wrap this up and say thank you all for coming. And I hope you've had a nice time and enjoyed the, uh, the 
uh, the podcast. It has been a pleasure hosting it, and it's always been lovely. It's always lovely to hear of informed jurors uh, talk more about anime, which is a great passion of all of us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and I hope that you have a nice evening and nice weekend. Thank you.